The interesting bit was this large scale underpayment of the state pension. I saw some numbers which are quite staggering. I think it was in the, one press article, it was this is money. Pensioners who missed out uh, been handed lump sum back payments of up to 128,000, at the average close to around 9,000 pounds. So obviously not insignificant sums of money here. Yeah, so, so I mean, what, what happened was I do a weekly column for This Is Money and people send in their questions and I try and answer one a week. And, and we had one about the state pension and we wrote it up and people read it and said, oh, hang on a minute, that's me. And people sent their mm. examples in and we checked some of these and we said, well, it's just on the wrong rate of pension. And it turned out there were three groups, mostly women, not exclusively, but mostly women. So there were women who, when their husband turned 65, their pension should have been uprated at least to the married woman's rate. So they were on 40, 50 pound, and they should have been getting 80 pound, that kind of figure. So mm -hmm. as long as the husband turns 65 after a certain date in 2008, so any time since then, when he turns 65 and claimed his pension, she should have had an uplift automatically. And in tens of thousands of cases, that didn't happen. The second thing that went wrong is when he died, her pension should have been reassessed as a widow. It didn't happen in tens of thousands of cases. And then third, when you reach 80, you're entitled to 82 pound a week pension on a non-contributory basis. So you don't even have to have a national insurance record. As long as you've lived in the country 10 years, you can have 82 wow. good a week just for being here. Uh, and and if you're on if you were on less than 82 by that point, you should have just been uplifted to 82. So and these are automatic things that should all be happening. Three of those this should isn't happen just claim for it, as in no, no. claiming no. No. So all three are cases where the woman is on a pension already, but it's low because of historical working patterns and all of the rest of it, 40, 50, 60 pound a week. And she's automatically entitled to an uplift when he t turns 65 and claims yes. his pension, an uplift when, he was wid when she's widowed, an uplift when she turns 80, any of those. So putting all that together, 135,000 people, mostly women, didn't get this. And it's a billion wow. pounds worth of back payments. Um, and some of it, and they're going to spend <clears throat> the next two years finding them. So wow. they've literally got 500 civil servants somewhere in Newcastle going one at a time through a big database to find this 135,000 people. So in theory, people you know, will get a letter in the post with a check, as it you know, metaphorically. Um, literally, but the reality, I suppose, is these records, assuming that they're up to date or that they have the correct address and all that sort of, there's all of that kind of administrative but issue that you might have. There is have. a yeah. percentage of people they don't think they'll find. Some of them have yeah. died. Yeah. So some have died since they were underpaid. So they will contact next to kin if they know who they are. You know, so it's just a, a complete what sort of mess. age group is this then? Sorry, Steve. So this is this is old state pensions. So it's this, women yeah. born before 1950, April 1953. So right. they would they would currently be what 70 ish and above, give or take. OK. Yeah. Um, and a lot I'm often contacted by sons and daughters on behalf of elderly relatives. I, I was contacted by a lady who I think was 73 on behalf of her mother. And her mother is 100 years old and lives in a care wow. home. Now, oh, this, yeah. this lady had never had a state pension. Wow. And really? it turned yeah. out that she, she'd come into the country late in life, but she, but she could have had the over 80s pension as soon as she turned 80, never claimed it. So we got her, you know, 4,000 a year pension and a year's back dating, you know, whereas these women in general had claimed a pension when they turned 60. Yeah. So they not very have... much. And then yeah. the system should have just kicked in to upgrade them. There are women who still do need to pick up the phone. And three groups just to mention. So first of all, anyone over 80 who has never claimed a pension yeah. should just claim because you don't need a national insurance record. So that, you know, I, I meet particularly people who've come into the country, you know, migrant family or whatever, no national insurance record at 80. 10 yeah. years in the country and have the pension at 80. Divorced women who divorce post-retirement, so silver splitters, sometimes they have them called, you know, don't think they know you've divorced. They don't. Yeah. As soon as you tell them you've divorced, they will have to reassess your pension using your ex-husband's national insurance. But only if you tell them and only from the day you tell them. Yes. So people just assume somehow government's joined up. My divorce is recorded somewhere. They must know. know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no. If you don't tell them, they won't do it. And then the third group is this slightly older group where the husband turns 65 before March 2008. So he's yes. now whatever that makes him 77 plus or something. Back mm. in the day, the woman did have to claim for this uplift when he retired. And thousands and thousands of women never did. There are women to this day who have still never done it. I hear from them each week. Oh, I, I could have claimed this 15 years ago. Nobody told me. Yes. Yeah. And what they used to do is get the husband to claim to, to. They'd say to the husband, do you want to claim your pension? Do you want another form for your wife? 
that's how it used to you know so so those women again have to pick up the phone and claim it because they, otherwise they won't get it and what's the likely bill for this this, this so a, bi this... a billion pounds of back payments Billions. for wow. and that's that's for the women who they the interest as well no interest they're not paying interest they're not paying they've decided they won't pay interest and I guess that brings on interestingly is, is to the engagement in terms of pensions. And again, this is something I come across an awful lot, is that sort of a cliff edge with in terms of retirement is that you're uh, faced with uh, needing to get an income from somewhere. And then you sort of check how much state pension you're going to get. And it's going to be 9,300, you know, and, and, and obviously the realisation that's going to be insufficient or ina inadequate effectively. What are your thoughts in terms of that that engagement and actually getting people engaged into it? And obviously auto-enrolment is a fantastic way of bringing people in into the pension regime. But do you think it's still insufficient as far as where we are, as far as auto-enrolment? You're obviously qualifying earnings. It's, it's, it's a band of earnings. It's 8% of that for, for the minimum level. Obviously, some companies do do more than that. But you think that needs to be in reality moved up or more needs to be done around that that element absolutely i mean I, the way i we, we did a paper the other day uh, which we called the ski slope of doom is the decline in traditional final salary type pensions so yes. we are more or less at the peak we think in yes. terms of people retiring today is kind of about as good as it's going to get for final salary pensions for people who work in the private sector. And next year and the year after and the year after, progressively, people will get less and less from that source. Because, as you know, these schemes have been closing for years. Yes. Gradually, that feeds through into retirement. So defined benefit DB final salary pensions are in retreat. But the DC cavalry hasn't even appeared on the horizon yet. Yes, you know, yeah. we've, we've done auto enrollment. We've put 10 million people into pensions, but only a few years ago. Yes, there's a it gap. It takes decades to build up a yes. decent pension, especially at 8% of qualifying earnings, as you say. What's going to happen for the next 20 odd years? You know, if you didn't have a big fat defined benefit pension, you won't have yet built up a good DC to just go on working or retire poor. I mean, those are kind of the options, really. So, uh, uh, so I think there needs to be urgency in government to get the extra money going in. Yeah, I do worry about this. I mean, because I, I have people contact me and 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 and, and literally um, somebody that is, you know, one to two years out and, and they want to stop working or, or, or in some cases they basically, uh, you know, retirement's been forced upon them due to work and they're suddenly finding themselves in this position and especially where they're renting, you know, with the, the, yeah. the potential to be renting in retirement and basically a large chunk of their state pension is taken up with rent and then beyond that they've got twenty thousand pounds in a pension pot you know this is you know that kind of position is really really difficult and, and that's a difficult sort of discussion with somebody around what they do in that that situation but uh, yeah it's, it's interesting it, it, it's that strange position you say we've gone from sort of defined benefit pension schemes where the the risk is with the scheme with the company the trust the, the trustees that have been set up um uh, to a position where actually the risk is now with the individual ultimately, isn't it? Deciding on where they invest, how much they contribute, what they do with their pension. It's a huge change, I think, in, in dynamic and, uh, is, and on yeah. the individual. And it can work really well. I mean, you know, I yeah. get a lot of positive feedback on pension freedoms, on people being, who, you know, generally better off, I suppose, who've got multiple pots, who can, you know, take one as cash, who can, you know, um, pay for the family holiday of a lifetime or, you know, get the kitchen done up or give something to the kids for a deposit on a house. You know, the, the flexibility to use your pension is great. But if you're not in that privileged position, if it's you, you know, having to pay rent in retirement is catastrophic. Yes, you know, I think yes. we underplay the role of that in in pension planning, you know, that actually just getting on the, the housing ladder, you know, people like me to always say saving a pension, saving a pension, saving a pension. But if you're not buying a house, you've got to save vastly more in a pension. To, oh, you know, you, so you basically need an equivalent pot that, that on goes floor, alongside yeah. that is going yeah. to be the pot that funds your uh, your your uh, rental, your, your yeah. where you live. So in a way, actually. Um, I, I'm not a great one in, you know, my house is my pension, but having a house so you don't have to pay rent in retirement, I think, is, is massively important. Just on your earlier point about engagement, you know, you're right. Auto enrollment is about inertia and defaults. You don't have to think about it. You're 25, yeah. 22. You put in a pension. Fine. You don't you know, whatever. Where I'm a big fan is things like midlife MOTs, as they call them, this idea yeah. that 50 or 45, you review not just your finances, but your career. You know, if we're all going to live to 100, as it were. 
then and we're going to work till late 60s on average and again averages i accept then we may not all do the same job all that time so what do i need to do now at my age to think about the next career i'll have and could i mm. now be doing some parallel training or re reskilling or qualification so that i can make that transition and work longer rather than just being pensioned off at you know 63 and struggling or or whatever so so we do need to engage people earlier and pension providers need to you know it's no good sending a wake-up pack you know three months before retirement no. you know no. it, it's hopeless I, I think that's a fascinating one. i think it is having those almost those milestone points whether it's at decade intervals or something like that as you say just to say where are you what's your position and just being mindful of you do need to be thinking about at some point in the future your retirement and where you're going to draw on your income. What assets are you going to utilise? I mean, auto enrolment was all about enabling people to build up decent pots without having to be well informed, make active choices, etc. You know, we know that w when we started, before auto enrolment started, coverage was falling. The proportion yeah. of private sector workers with a pension was going down. It still is for the self-employed. It's literally falling for the self-employed. So yeah. big issue there. Um, but a, a decent pot gives you choices. But but people on average, for perfectly good reasons, may not really know what to do with it. Um, we know, for example, people just completely cash out. Not not huge pots, but small, you know, modest pots. And that might be entirely sensible. Um, but one thing I think we should change is at the moment to get your hands on your tax free cash. There's that sort of feeling. Well, it's just simpler to take the lot. You know, I'll take my whole twenty thousand pounds yes. to get my five thousand tax free. Don't know what to do with the other fifteen. I'll bung it in a cash ISA. <laughs> yes, paying 0 point yes. diddly squat with inflation yes. of five or six percent you know that's terrible so yes. i think we should make it much easier for people to get their sweaty mitts on the fight on the 25 percent and leave the rest behind mm, i know i know yeah. there are ways of delivering that outcome but we we need to make it much simpler for people preferably in my view just leave it in the workplace pension where it grew up take your yes. tax cash and leave the rest behind to be invested at low cost and decent return yeah, this was so tricky about these old, older star schemes, and we come across this a lot in terms of people actually being able to access it, take the money out. You know, the older star schemes basically is it's they've got to take the tax free cash and then annuitize, or they've got to transfer the residual out. And in some cases, they have safeguarded rights and things like that, and they can't do it. So, yeah, it's, it's certainly tricky with those older star um, but, but, schemes. But modern, modern ones as well, you know, you, you're auto enrolled into a GPP or a master trust or something like that. Mm. You want your 25%, and, and just mentally, you think about your whole pension. The, the statistics show the most common thing someone with a small pot will do is take the lot. Yeah. yeah. You know, and Just, and yeah. if that's what they're actually doing, you know, you or I might say, well, they don't need to because they could do this sort of drawdown or whatever. They, they're just doing it. So we have to do something about that, because for me, the big the big failure of the system at the moment is not, you know, people blowing the lot on sports cars. It's people actually being uber cautious. Yeah, you know, taking all their money and bunging it in cash. That's yes. the real harm at the moment. Yeah, I did have to ask you about the Lamborghini comment, you know, as far as the press was concerned. It was the fact that the, my, my favourite one was from the Mirror. It was Blingo, uh, pensioners to blow five billion after cashing in their retirement. Did you know to some degree that that would have some kind of reaction with the media? But, but so what happened was the day after the budget, so I obviously knew George Osborne was about to announce the pension freedoms, and then they sent me out to do media the day after. Mm. And a BBC journalist, in live BBC journalist news channel, said to me, what about the Lamborghini set? What about people who blow the lot on a sports car? And I said, well, if people spend their pensions on a Lamborghini, it's fine by me. They got to the evening news bulletin, cut the question. It was just <laughs> as if I'd woken up you that just, morning that was to announce to yeah. a grateful nation that yeah. they could buy sports cars. Kind of and next day, as well as the, the tabloids, so I was in the sun with my face superimposed on a sports car with, you know, let the OAPs have Lambo. Yeah. Kind of thing. But it's funny. I mean, A, it's quite nice to have said anything ever that anybody remembers. That's kind of nice. But in a funny sort of way, it kind of encapsulated the idea that pensions is for you it's not so much pensions communication is is telling people off making them feel yeah. guilty telling them they shouldn't have lattes yeah because it should yeah, go yeah. in their pension but you know so much is negative and i wanted to communicate that pensions are positive they're about freedom and about choice and if you know a slightly flippant comment illustrated that well that's fine one of the consequences of the move to a new state pension is people who were contracted out so often retired public service workers or other are short of the full flat rate Mm. But if perhaps they retired before pension age, they so retired at 60, pension age of 66, there's this, this gap, this period where they could pay national insurance on a voluntary basis and the government subsidises this. So as you know, it's you know one year's contributions, relatively cheap, boost your pension by a 35th, about a fiver a week. And the maths works out that even if you allow for tax, 
probably after about four years, you've got your money back. So if you're going to live more than four years, unless you're on benefit or something like that, this is a remarkably good deal. And the amount the government raises through class three national insurance has shot up dramatically. But I think one of your clients was saying, oh, well, yeah, but I've got lots of gap years. And so, you know, it doesn't work for me. But I think what they misunderstood is every extra voluntary year is an extra fiver on your pension as long as you're still not at the limit. So if somebody's yes. well short of the limit, they can buy year after year, you know, fill the boots. They can do yes. it again and again and again. And each time they're getting this good deal. So, you know, in, the only thing you have to be careful of is not trying to buy years that go too far back because before 2016, the maths is a bit different. So you just need to check that any year you buy is actually boosting your pension before you hand the money over. But it's a simple, you know, the return you're getting on this is far better than most other investments, to be honest. Just get, I mean, get, get a state pension forecast online. So check your record, yeah. see where the gaps are and so on. Um, and, and you know, ultimately it's HMRC you're giving the money to because it's national insurance, but uh, that then feeds through to your pension record. So uh, yeah, just yeah. check before you hand the money over.